We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the CRM Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management, archaeology, and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 206 for January 13th, 2021. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk about common resume and CV issues. So, and I mean it this time, break out that CV and follow along because you need a job and because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today is Bill in California. Hello. Doug in Scotland. Hey, everyone. And Stephen in Calgary. Hello. So this is our first recording of... 2021. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting real annoyed by all the news sources and things like that saying, it's a brand new year. Let's do everything over again. 2020 is gone. Screw 2020. But I don't know. It feels like there's going to be a lot of the same 2020 BS happening in 2021 for the next at least six or seven months, <laughs> if not longer. So I don't know if 2021 is going to be any better at all. But well, I think everybody's kind of hopeful, right? That Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember what the movie is, but I watched a Amazon movie. I got cheated. It's a horrible movie. Don't rent it <laughs> on Amazon Prime. Don't rent it. But it was about if COVID mutated and we were four years into the lockdown. <laughs> so that's that was the most interesting part of the whole movie. Don't rent it yeah. once again. But I think everyone's hoping that that doesn't happen, that we're not four years in with mutated you know, COVID-32 and we can't go outside. Well, I mean, it, it's already mutated to a slightly more beneficial form right now. I mean, it seems not beneficial, but it's it's more contagious, that more contagious strain that's going around the world. It's in like, the well, last I saw, it's in like 33 countries and been detected in at least three states, but it, you know, it's more than that. But I, I was talking to my brother-in-law, who is a physician's assistant at Mount Sinai in Manhattan, and he said that the data that they've seen says that, yeah, it do, it is highly contagious. It's way more contagious than the original strain, but as with all evolution, it lost something, right? It, it evolved to be more efficient, but lost a little bit of its efficacy, which means what they're seeing in some patients is that the symptoms are actually way less, even in even in problem patients, people with pre-existing conditions and stuff like that. The symptoms are a little bit less. doesn't mean it's still potentially not going to kill you, but you know, that's, I guess, a bright side to that. So if more people got it because it's more highly contagious, maybe more antigens will be out there. We'll get a little better herd immunity combined with the vaccine. Might be able to knock it out with its own evolution. But well, I keep hoping that it was the, the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter that all gave us special <laughs> powers is what it really is. That it gave us special powers to fight yeah. against, you know, illness, but also gave us special powers to attract money. And that the next time you log into your bank account app, you're going to see that it's totally loaded, much more than two thousand dollars that they can't even pass, more than the six hundred. We're talking like off the charts. So you know, I'm hoping nice. this is the conjunction. That's what I want. None of us get hurt by COVID anymore, and we all attract money like magnets. I <laughs> uh, know, guys. I kind of feel like this is like you know how they like they, they market stuff to women where it's basically the same thing only in pink. I kind of feel like <laughs> people are marketing like. 2021 like that it's like it's like 2020 only there's a one in it <laughs> like you know somehow that's gonna make right. a difference yeah <laughs> like, yeah you know long-term hey. trends and stuff i don't mean this to be like negative or anything but like i, I would actually hope I that like, right. people are, are starting to address the more long-term stuff that like it's not just a pandemic but there's a lot of systematic stuff that America almost finished as a democracy like two months ago. Well, technically yeah. it might finish on Tuesday, is it, when they decide to override the votes of, of everyone who, who voted? But, you know, I'm hoping that like it's, it's, it's part of a longer term trend where we improve stuff as opposed to just like chalking it up to being a pandemic. And that's the only reason things were crappy for people. Yeah. Of course, now uh, I'm forever going to think of 2021 as the pink year. So. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> the pink year. <laughs> it's, it's the least I could do. <laughs> nice. Doug, you're nice. exactly right. Like the pandemic is just the symptom of the problems that were already 
agitating for mm -hmm. years and years. Then we ended up getting just like the you know race uprising this summer is the symptom of the bad problem. So I'm with Doug. Let's cure the illnesses rather than just treat the symptoms. Exactly, exactly. And hey, I, I didn't intend to bring this up, but you know, Bill, you mentioned the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. So it made me think of space. And I saw an article this morning talking about a book from a, I think he's a Harvard professor in astronomy. So he sounds like a, a credible guy, but he has written a book about what he thinks is, is reporting as the first verifiable alien technology that has entered our solar system. And it was back in 2017, an object, and I remember hearing something about this object. It was long and skinny, very long and skinny, which is not a natural type of shape, which is one of their clues. He thinks it's the smoking gun, really, that defines it. That and the fact that it was accelerating when it should have been decelerating away from the sun because it kind of went around the sun and stuff like that. But he thinks it was some kind of alien object. He doesn't really know much about it. But he wrote a book that's coming out at the end of this month about that. And I'm like, well, you know, you guys, there's really one way to tell whether or not an alien object has visited the solar system. Did they build any pyramids? Right? Because that's what aliens do when they come to this world is they build pyramids. Is that not true? Oh, Chris. Bad Chris. <laughs> bad joke. Oh, bad like, are there oh any new gosh. pyramids? <laughs> that's oh that's like dad level jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like aliens would build pyramids because that's the, you know, like, like universal byproduct of gravity, right? So it doesn't matter if humans right. built it or aliens built it, it's still going to be a pyramid. Right. I, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There you, go. But, there you go. Hold on. Hold on. They also, let's not forget, aliens built like Stonehenge and uh, that's, true. That's, that's not a natural shit. No, no. They definitely built that. Yeah. yeah. Nazca lines. I mean, there's a cat there. I mean, that's not a natural shape. <laughs> I mean, they built New York City, for that matter. That's not natural either. So, <laughs> yeah, no joke. I mean, I see I see signs of aliens all around me all the time. I know. Right? I also see signs so. of, of talking about space when we were talking about Apple products, Star Trek, because sometimes mm -hmm. it does seem like we're in an episode of the Next Generation. However, not as cool <laughs> and taking much longer than the you know sixty minutes as it used to take. Yeah. Anyway. So we're going to proceed on this episode, but this being the first episode of 2021, I wanted to just report a few stats on the podcast because I think it's I think it's interesting. And we haven't had this level of statistics before, which is why I have never done this in the uh, near nine year history of this podcast, because we, we joined a new hosting platform. It's going to be two years in April. So but really kind of the end of April when we really kicked it off. And that hosting platform has allowed us to have a lot better metrics and data about our shows uh, and tell us a little more about, you know, where, where people are listening and how long they're listening and how much you're listening and things like that. And I just thought we'd provide some interesting statistics. So in 2020, which was our first full year of being on this platform, which again, isn't a great year because I could already tell that downloads were down a little bit, especially at the start of the pandemic, because people stopped listening when they normally listen, which was people stopped commuting to work. And to be honest, they probably stopped working out and going to the gym. And that's when people listen to podcasts. But then as people got used to being in a pandemic and being in quarantine, they started doing things that were a little more normal for them and then started listening to podcasts again. And we can actually see that in the data. In fact, weirdly, in September, we had a huge spike in, in listening. I'm not really sure what's what's up with that, but maybe that was the Canadian one. We had the Canadian episode called Can They CRM Can Unionize? They did it in Canada, <laughs> which released on September 9th. And that was one of our big spikes. So I think maybe they just uh, helped promote that for us. But we had a total of 16,381 downloads in 2020 for this podcast. And if you're curious, we had about I think it was 430 or 440,000 um, across the whole Archaeology Podcast Network. So that's pretty cool. And our most listened to episode or most downloaded episode, I should say, was the NEPA 2020 episode with Tom King, episode 190 that we released in May, May 20th of 2020. So that's pretty cool. And our second most downloaded episode was A New Decade for CRM Archaeology, episode 180, released January 1st, 2020. We were so optimistic about the new decade starting, and then the world went to hell. So yeah, interesting stats. It'll be interesting to see what happens next year when we have, I would assume, a more regular year, although nothing's going to be regular about 2021, as we just said. So who knows? I was just noticing, I think those are all episodes I wasn't on. Which kind of hurts a little bit. Ego, ego's a little bit bruised on that one. 
No, see, the numbers are inflated because you only listen to the ones you're not on, right? So we got an extra boost on us. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, as we mentioned, I think in the last episode, we had to kind of pivot a little bit for the last episode because we had some connection issues with our guest. However, we still can't get that guest on. This time it's just scheduling. Uh, well, it's, we're just moving past that. But we're still going to talk about what we had intended to talk about two weeks ago, which is resume. The guest actually sent us their resume. And we're not going to mention who it is. No names, no anything like that, of course. But we're going to use this as an example to, to, to first give some pointers on this particular resume and then talk about different types of resumes and CVs and and things like that. And, you know, just, just in general, how to, how to make these things better because it's 2021, it's January. And if you aren't spending the winter, at least part of the winter, taking all your experience from the year, you probably should have already done this, but now's a good time if you haven't revamping your CV, writing some new resumes, getting your cover letters ready and getting ready to get out there and get some work for the spring and fall. Now, this particular one that we were sent I'm actually not sure if it's, it says it's a CV, so we'll go with that. It's pretty short. That doesn't mean anything, but CVs are typically for people who are more established in the field. They can get longer and longer and longer, but let's just talk about this one as it stands. And I think I'll just kick it off, Doug, unless you want to comment on this before I do that. Yeah, it was just to say that the person was looking for jobs in the UK and in America. So ah. in the UK... They call a CV basically what we would call a resume. So, okay. um, and I think you would also caught some stuff where like there was different spelling of artifacts with an E instead of an I. And that's, you know, that's just like another pointer we could, we can mention as well and maybe toss something over to, to uh, Stephen. Cause I think Canadian English is somewhat like a hybrid between like American and British English. And so, yeah, there's those little things that, people need to adapt their CV to the country they're planning to work in or resume, CV slash resume. But when I guess we should just clarify, we're talking about the short two pages that most people send in, not your full career length, 20 pages of work sort of stuff. Yeah, Canadian English is terminally mid-Atlantic. So some things they go the US way, some things they go the British way. So you can't really pick one and run with it. Although, generally, if you do like American spelling, but then just add used to everything, it's going to be fine. Oh, and the E comes after the R. <laughs> That's all you really need. Yes, that, that is right. so true. So true. Well, I, I think the takeaway, though, is to play to your audience, right? So if you're looking for jobs in the UK, have a UK version of your resume. You know what I mean? I mean, send that UK version to the UK audience, send the US version to the US audience and send the Canadian version to the Canadian audience. I mean, if you're if you're not sure of what that means, like if I were to send my CV over to somebody in the UK, it would not be the UK version because I don't know how to make a UK version of my CV, right? And if I thought that maybe that was going to cause me to not get a job because I spelled artifacts with an I instead of an E, then you know, maybe I would probably run this by somebody like Doug, who's been there a while or somebody else. Hey, David Connolly would be a good one. <laughs> Send it over to him and say, hey, what do you think about this? Would somebody reject this because they didn't use local, you know, uh, methods of spelling for your, you know, for the language over here. So it's the same thing as if you were trying to get a job in, you know, Mexico or something like that, you'd probably want to have your CV in Spanish and have a thorough understanding of the language, right? So that's no different when you're talking about a, a dialect of a language, I would say. Again, I don't think it's a deal breaker, but it's just something that popped out to me and would make me, I don't know, it's just one of those things that just sticks in your head. Like, again, it's not a deal breaker, but it, it makes you stick out. And I'm not sure if that's a good way or in a, in a bad way. And anytime you stick out, you want to stick out in a good way. I think uh, one exception to that is if your job is, I don't know, color coordinator of artifacts or whatever, mm -hmm. and it was in the UK, you know, and, and so like color was spelled in the British manner, then mm -hmm. I would keep that because that's the job title, right? Sure. Um, despite the fact that, you know, like I, I wouldn't go and, and like respell like actual job titles, but, you know, for, for the description of the jobs that you did and stuff like that, I would use the appropriate spelling of color, which, you know, wherever you happen to be. Sure. 
Yeah, I think, and this is probably going to be just a general advice to everyone who's listening, is someone once described this, and if you don't do fishing, I'm not sure if it's a better description, but they described like putting together a resume and a CV or, you know, applying for jobs is a bit like fishing where, you know, you're, you're throwing out different sort of lures. You could be in the exact same spot fishing, you know, exact same time of the year. And, you know, you have to use like a different lure and they sort of described like the resume is a different lure and you try different things. And sometimes you get bites and sometimes you don't. And I think generally I, I personally find it super annoying people's policing of spelling and language, but there are going to be people who are going to care about that. And you're applying to a job where you don't have that, you, you're not going to be able to make that decision of who's reviewing your your application. And you, you're kind of hoping that they're not going to be, you know, a grammar Nazi of some sort or a spelling Nazi, but you can't control that. And if they are, that could cost you the job. So I think, well, I, while I encourage anyone who's listening not to be that person, there are those people out there and you probably have to put together a sort of spotless one. And then, you know, this goes back to like, just, just give people a heads up if you're American trying to come over to the UK. I mean, that's a whole different thing about trying to get visas and stuff. But yeah, they get very uppity about how you spell archaeology as well. So like some people get really intense about like how people spell words and I, I've known people who would just like trash resumes and just like throw them away and be like oh this person spelled archaeology wrong they don't know what they're talking about and it's like yeah, yeah. dude it's not that big of a deal but if, you, if you're tr- applying yeah you can't really take that risk you, you kind of have to try everything in the book and you know, it's, it may not work, but you don't want to be that, as Chris was saying, you don't want to have stick out for a negative reason. You only want to stick out for a positive reason. Yeah. All right. Well, that is a good place to end this segment and we'll pick it up on the other side and continue talking about issues with all resumes and CVs that we've seen and using this specific one as an example back in a minute. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R.com and use the code CRMARC. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on pricing, and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. Welcome back to the CRMR podcast, episode 206. And we are talking about resumes and CVs. And we're getting ready to talk about a good example here a little later on, which over the break brought up an interesting issue that we need to talk about. Doug. Yeah, so it's just also to mention if you're applying for different countries, paper size is actually different in different countries. So, well, actually, I should probably say it's pretty much probably America versus everywhere else. Because <laughs> everywhere else is probably on the A system, which is divisions of one meters. So, like, yeah, paper, like a typical A4 is not the same as what you'd get on your typical printer page in the United States. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you are sending in resumes to different countries, one of them being the United States and one being somewhere else, and they're like, only send two pages, or you have formatting of some sort that like specific, so it looks good, you know, you have certain words and it doesn't break a- across certain pages, definitely check where you're sending it to and what the page size should be. 
because if not, you, you might have the perfect formatting and then it gets sent over and they open up a, a Word doc and it does not look good at all because, you know, things have got bumped around and stuff. So <laughs> it's just a, a quick warning. Most everywhere else uses the A size papers. A4 is the sort of standard. It's all metric, but you want to be careful about that. Because uh, uh, mm-hmm. we were just, Stephen and I, uh, Bill sent us a document and Stephen and I were like, oh, it's, it's not on one page, even though it says it should be on one page. And that's how we sort of figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's just a, a heads up for people who are thinking about going to different countries, even in North America, if you jump up to Canada. That's right. No, okay. actually, Canada still uses the American paper sizes. So, Oh, it does. Is that all of Canada? This is, this is just a fluke of software, which I will jump on and kind of call Doug out on, on one thing that he said that I strongly disagree with, never send a Word document. Yes. Um, always, always, if it's something that doesn't need to get edited, it should mm-hmm. be a PDF because you should lock yeah. in the formatting and the layout and, and everything like that. It, Word will shift things. If you open it on a different machine, it'll, it'll break uh, if you're using styles and you should be using styles, it'll break styles. If you open it on a different machine, it's a quick route to just messing up your CV or your resume when you really don't want, like you want good formatting. So make it good formatting and turn it into PDF. And and that way, regardless of who you send it to, they can open it and see it because PDF is a pretty standard file format. Yeah. Yeah. Also, that reminds me, fonts as well, because if you do a PDF, usually it may not store the fonts correctly when you copy and paste, but it'll usually have the image correct. So you could, if you have decided on some sort of font, it'll work, especially if you're going between like, say a Mac and a, a PC or something like that with a word doc. Gosh, mm-hmm. so many fonts that are on like Mac, you can't get on word and vice versa. And again, that will really screw up any of your formatting. Well, and you have no way to know, the person who's opening your CV or resume, like what they're using, right? I mean, you have no way to know that. So they, they may not even be using anything. Maybe they're importing it into a Google Doc and it's converting it. I mean, who knows, right? So, or I'm on a Mac. Maybe I'm going to open it in Pages and Pages will automatically convert the Word document and it's going to blow everything up. It does an all right job, but you're right. If, if styles are being used or if, you know, any special fonts are being used or anything like that, none of that formatting is going to be preserved. So that is the thing I was going to say is DocX versus PDF. Unless they specifically request, which is another thing we can get into later, you know, look at the job requirements. If they request a DocX or a Word document or a Word compatible document, which is another phraseology people use sometimes, then send them that, right? But if they don't say anything, then send them a PDF. That's one thing that's noticeably good about this thing that we were saying here, this example, is the person put their name and the letters and CV inside the file name. That's another thing that I always say to do because do you know how many CVs or resumes I've been sent that just said cv.pdf? Like no name or anything because that's what they titled it on the computer because who else is what it be? It's mine. cv.pdf. I'm just going to ship this off to somebody not expecting that they just received a hundred other cv.pdfs <laughs> and they're all sitting in one folder. Don't make me do the work. <laughs> uh, same for job title. Include the job title because yeah. a lot of sometimes job adverts will be like, we're looking for technician, crew chief, project officer. Yeah. And You'd be surprised how often like CV, CVs get thrown into the wrong folder for the wrong job yeah, um, or resumes or whatever. And then they're looking at it and they're like, you don't have enough experience for this. Straight into the, mm-hmm. into the tr- trash for that when actually you were applying for the tech job. <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. So the next thing I wanted to bring up was basic formatting, right? And the one... One of the other big downsides of actually sending a Word document is, and some people don't like this, but I always have hidden characters turned on. And by that, I mean, you can see the paragraphs, you can see the tabs, you can see the spaces. I just, I've been so used to typing and creating documents with that turned on. The only time I ever turn it off is really, honestly, right before I'm about to print something, if I have to print it or send it off to, you know, to, for printing, like if it's a report or something like that, because I just want to see it clean, right? Sometimes I can get a little messy having all those things turned on, but when I opened up this CV that we were sent, or resume rather, 
all that stuff is turned on and it immediately tells me some things about the author's skill level with Microsoft Word or whatever word processing program that they used. Because a few things I'll note right off the bat, there's there's a few bulleted sections at the top. We've got general and specific skills and then achievements. And the bullets are not indented. Like the bullets are right out at the same register level as the beginning of the headings, general skills, specific skills, and achievements. And also there's a carriage return or a paragraph return after specific skills and achievements, but not after general skills before the bullets. So I immediately see some formatting inconsistencies there. And that's just attention to detail. But then there's you know, knowledge of how to actually do formatting problems as well, because the education section is a complete mess, right? Spaces were definitely used to first write a date and then space out the name of the thing. And then, you know, the next line down was just, you could see that the person hit the space bar about 30 times to try to line up the next line down, which if you don't know how to move your tabs over or move your indentation over, and it looks like they accidentally did that uh, about halfway down this section on the first page because the returns and the spaces start further in. So they kind of started to get it right. I think accidentally and then spaced it over anyway, right? And it just, if you do it right and you turn all this hidden character stuff off, it doesn't look bad, right? You can pass and you get away with it. But it tells me right away that this person doesn't know how to quickly format their document. And when I'm having somebody write a report and they're doing table after table after table of data and different things, you know, if they're spending an extra minute or an extra two minutes or an extra three minutes on something and they're doing it, many times a day, many times a year, well, how many hours is that costing me, right? As an employer, how many hours is that costing me because you don't know how to do this? I, sure, I could go teach somebody how to do that, but how many other things do I have to teach you if you don't know these basic things about you know, formatting? And to me, in 2021, this is basic formatting. We actually talked about this on the Archaeotech podcast for basic skills you need to be a human <laughs> and an employee these days. And I'm sorry, but Microsoft Word or word processing skills, this is this is basic tabs setting tabs is basic fight me on that bill no i i absolutely agree and also that's you know what so there's a couple of things going on here we're talking about creating a document in one formatting system basically one software package and then transferring it to another one and sometimes in the translation there's stuff that messes up like if you use google docs which i mean we use google docs for better or for worse and then we have to turn it into Microsoft Word to get a PDF. Or we have to turn it from Google Docs into PDF. And like every time we're translating it, if you have any of those kind of formatting things, like you need to know how to handle that. And yeah. Microsoft Word is the basic software we're using to create documents. I mean, it's somehow cornered the market. When I first started, there was WordPerfect, which was, you know, I think better in a lot of ways than Microsoft Word, but it takes mm -hmm. a while to learn how to use that one. If you have an Apple and you're using Pages, it takes a while for you to learn how to use Pages. And then, you know, PDF, if you actually spend the money and you have Acrobat and you're actually formatting things in Acrobat, or if you've even stepped it up to the higher level in design, which I would really hope that one day we're all using InDesign like all of the time. But then again, a lot of the word processing stuff that happens in Microsoft Word, I don't really see that happening in InDesign. Any which way, all three of those things are transferable skills and marketable skills way beyond archaeology, right? So if you know, you're looking at, and, and like Chris said, I always have the, I always am able to see the symbols. I'm always able to see the formatting too. That's how I write. When I open things up, that's just how it automatically appears. And that's the same exact thing that I see when I looked at this one. But what's even more important than that is I never even downloaded this until you said something about it because I don't take the time to download it. Like we're yeah. seriously spending seconds a day on something that's like someone's, you know, major life decision here. So if it's not, if it doesn't look great in whatever file type, like if I try to open this thing in pages and it won't work or something like that, you know, that that's a huge problem because we're not going to really spend the time to download stuff. We're not going to, you know, a lot of times people are looking at stuff on their phone. If you met them at a conference or something like that, you send them an email, they're looking at it on their phone. If it doesn't look good on all these different kinds of things, if it's not a responsive file type like PDF, all of that stuff hurts you. And every single tiny 
thing that we see that's, you know, something like you were saying, every, anything that the employer sees that they have to make more of an investment in you, that you're not actually ready to go do that kind of job or that kind of thing, that all counts against you. Right. It really does. And and just looking at this, right, just looking at this again, I, I place a lot of emphasis on first impressions and, you know, the, I, because I think you can tell a lot from looking at something like this or for, I always use the example of looking at, if I happen to see somebody's desk or their car, right? You look inside somebody's car or their desk or something like that. If it's an absolute trash pit and there's everything all over the place, well, something tells me that's how your brain is organized as well. Not very well. And are you going to be able to manage a project if that's what I'm hiring you for, right? Are you going to be able to manage even a field crew if you can't manage your own life and you can't keep things in order? And it comes down to my first impression. I don't even know who this person is, to be honest. Uh, I've barely even talked to them. So don't know anything about them except for what I'm seeing right here. And what I'm seeing right here is in a lack of attention to detail and, and, and just some some poor formatting choices. Like they, like they've never, like they didn't take a look at this a second time after they put it together and said, you know what, that just looks a little weird to me. Like for example, the whole education section is bolded for some reason. I don't even know why. I think everything after the, the edu- yeah, education and employment experience, it's all bolded the whole thing, I- including the title. And I, it just baffles me as to why somebody would do that. But this kind of stuff I point out. Yeah. It was just to sort of take along that sort of theme of first impressions and, I think Mm -hmm. we should also mention is like how you write a resume or CV for your entry level jobs is not how you write one for your project manager or, you know, principal investigator. Those are completely two different CVs and you should change how you do that. And, and possibly we can get into a bit of, you know, in the United States is the resume and the CV and the CV is like all your work. And at senior positions, you, you probably are more likely to send in a CV, but on your, your entry level positions, it's going to be a resume there. I mean, one, you're probably not going to have, you know, 20 pages of a CV, but if you do, they're not going to read it. It's, it's something like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it depends on the year, but you know, a bad year, they might, people will get a hundred to 200 resumes come in within a couple of days of posting a job, you know, when there's no jobs out there. And when you calculate the time, basically (laughs) you have like 30 seconds to, if to not spend, you know, to just keep down looking through like 200 resumes, like keep that to an hour and a half, that's 30 seconds per resume you have to flip through. And so, you know, if it's an entry level job, there's going to be a ton more people going for it. And chances are the people are not going to spend much time on it. Whereas if it's a senior position, you might have half a dozen people and yeah, you want to put in all your experience and really do, they're going to spend some time on it. But entry level, it should be quick, easy, one to two pages that might not even get to the second page. And when you have that, your first impression should be the very, the first line should be your most critical information. Mm -hmm. And so for entry level positions, so in in the UK, you should put down if you have a driver's license and a CSCS card. And the reason you have a, you need to do that is because to work on construction sites, you need to have a CSCS card. It's tied in. You have to do a test for health and safety. It's not too applicable to archeology, span but the health and safety is something required to be on a construction site. And you're, that's most of the jobs is being on active construction site. So you need to have that, that card. And so if you're flipping through what people want to see is like, okay, check, they have a CSCS card, check, they can drive, check, they have a degree and maybe some experience. That's all I need to know. And I might just stop uh, looking through applications at that point and just pick that person. But, you know, it's, it's finding those unique things to the areas and that's going to be different for different countries in different parts of the country. So like as you head out West, if you're going for like a crew chief job or project officer, they're going to want to know, are you BLM permitted for that state? And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it varies, but you know, there's usually regions within that state and that's what you want to put. So like, if you're going for for probably help even as a tech position, but if you're going for a crew chief, your first line is going to want to be is I am BLM permitted in Nevada for 
Actually, Chris, you'll yeah. know this more than I, I do. I could say for New Mexico, I'd be like, you know, yeah. uh, Northwest and Northeast. And, you know, and that means that I could lead up a, a, a team on my own on federal, well, not just it's BLM land, but that's most of the land. And so that's a huge thing. And that's, those are those key things. Those first impressions is actually getting across that, you know, enough about the local archeology span professional setup and you know the key information that they're looking for. And because they might have 30 seconds, you need to make sure that's at the top. Yeah, that's good. And I want to talk a little bit more about formatting in the third segment about, you know, what should be included and not, but that's, that stuff's gold. And, you know, it comes down to stuff like just, just to wrap up this segment, like the BLM permitting thing, you know, if you're, if you're not, if you're looking for a BLM job, like if that's where you're applying, then definitely if you're doing a resume, highlight that fact, right? Highlight that on there, like Doug said. But if you're not trying to get a BLM job, if you're working on, I don't know if the project is on some other land, maybe it's on U.S. Forest Service land, they could really give a damn that you have a BLM permit, right? Now, it might be important if you're looking for an upper level job, that if you're BLM permittable, and you have to say that too, understand the language. You don't actually have a BLM permit unless you're an employer, right? If you have a BLM permit, you're an employer. <laughs> you're on somebody else's permit or you're permittable for prehistoric and historic resources in different areas or across the state or whatever the case may be. So permittable, you have to get the language down. And again, that could be important if you're working on a project on Forest Service land, if maybe you're looking for an upper level position and they just want to know what kind of experience you have in the area. If you're permittable across the state for prehistoric and historic, well, that's important, even though they're not going to permit you. It's important to know that you could do that because that's the experience level that you have, right? Actually, Chris, just to go back to that, it's different for different states because in yeah, New Mexico, sure. it's 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 not with the employer. It's actually with the individual. You have to have 40 sure. days of excavation, 20 days, 25 days of survey, or at least you used to like a decade ago. Yeah. Nevada has the same requirements. You have to have your individual qualifications, but you don't actually get a permit. That's qualifications to be listed on someone else's permit, right? You don't get an excavation permit or a survey permit in Nevada. You get the ability to be listed on their permit at whatever level they're listing you at, but you still have to have individual qualifications. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's exactly the same as New Mexico, but hey, let's finish this discussion on the other side, though, because we've got a lot more to talk about on CVs and resumes. So let's do that. We'll come back and wrap this up back in a second. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun T-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. All right, welcome back to the final segment of episode 206 of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. And Bill, we didn't get to you at the end of segment two there, so... What were your comments on that? Yeah, this is so writing a one page resume is a f- first assignment that I ask students to do in my classes. I ask them to do it if they work in my lab for sure, because the, you know, the idea is as they're doing their stuff there on campus and interacting with people and seeing, you know, guest speakers and stuff, you need to be in a situation where you're constantly prepared to send, you know, something to a person who could possibly hire you. So it's important for you to have this kind of thing saved to your phone or saved to some kind of cloud server somewhere. Now, in if you're actually applying to jobs and there's a job post, you're going to model this one page resume to the specific job post. But if you're just, you know, if you need something to get you out there for certain kinds of positions, as was mentioned before, you know, being a crew chief or something higher, you're going to maybe have two pages, maybe even longer. If you're just going for an archaeological technician position, you're going to have, you know, a one pager. And then if you're going for these more higher up jobs, uh, if you're going for a postdoc or a professional, you're going to have a CV that's going to be the dumpster of everything you've ever done in your life that relates to archaeology. But the one thing that I tell folks when they're creating these is that they should think about the individual who's going to ultimately read this because you're going to be working for a human being. And, you know, as Doug was saying, they, they could have hundreds of resumes to look through. So you literally only have about 30 seconds and it needs to be all, you know, straightforward and, and set up specifically to there. And what the what they're looking for, every one, every person is concerned about how they care more about themselves and how you can benefit them than 
probably anything else. I mean, that's just how human beings are. And so yeah. when they're looking at your resume in the first couple of seconds, they want to see what do you know and what skills do you have and all that stuff that can help me with this job. And then in a field like archaeology, is there anything in this that might have a connection to another person I know? So that could be the thing. If they see that you worked on a project or you were, you know, in someone's lab or you took a class from a certain professor and you did some applied aspect of work, you know, even that could be something that would connect like, oh, I know that person. She's a great, you know, archaeologist. We have a great relationship. Maybe I'll just text her right now and ask, you know, should I hire Bill or should I, you know, check this person out? Right. So this thing goes beyond. Beyond just, you know, kind of demonstrating what kind of an employee you are, it can actually go to much bigger levels of showing your your network and, you know, how embedded you are in archaeology. So it's it's key if there's a possible way for you to figure out who the hiring people are, who the people at the company are to see if there's any kind of connection, any kind of regional specialty, any kind of, you know, university or hometown or state or something like that, that you know that they do work in that has a connection to your experience. Because like I said, folks are concerned about themselves and they like to hire people who know about things that they know. So, you know, I guess like attracts like in this case. And if you've got a connection to a university or a project or something like that, even that can be something that can help you get a job or get an interview. Yeah. Just to riff off of uh, Bill, you know, if you're, if you're starting out and you have no experience, try to do a field school in the area where you're going to work or would like to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause people will look at it and it's pretty common, you know, here in the UK, they'll, they'll look at students and they'll be like, Ooh, field school in Cyprus. They're not going to, they're not going to know British archaeology. And some people get quite uh, uppity about, you know, it needs to be like exactly in their state. You can't just do Southwest archaeology. You need to do that. And then also people like to think, like to relate to other people and they'll look at it and see like, oh, they went to the same school I did. Never mind that we're like 30 years apart and probably didn't have the same professors and there's probably almost no connection whatsoever. People will still hire people based on, oh, they went to this school. It's a good school. It's my school sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, if you can get local experience and you're going for local jobs, do that. Even volunteering. If you can get volunteer experience, that's going to look a lot better that it's some sort of local dig or, you know, local washing artifacts in a museum over than say a field school, regardless of the quality, like the field school could have been like top notch, best in the world. It could have been run all by CRM people, but they'll look at it and be like, Peru, that's not our archeology. span We want, you know, upstate New York. And that, that can cost you a little bit there as well. Right. Right. So to follow up with what Doug was saying, well, first, if you can't get local experience, you know, try at least, and maybe this is more for a cover letter than the actual resume, but try, try at least that you can illustrate that you understand, you know, what the local archaeology is like that you're applying for, and try to make your experience somehow seem applicable, right? Right. While I haven't actually done any work in this particular sort of eco region, I have worked in similar environments such as this, 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 you know, and, and, and that way people will be like, oh, well, you know, they, they understand that this is a thing that we want them to do and they have some experience that does apply. And, and so you're, you're kind of in that sale and, and it's a tough thing, right? But, but that's a good thing. And yeah. To, expand that to a broader sense, make it clear that you know what you're applying for. And, and we kind of talked about that, like, you know, mentioning that you're applying for a tech position rather than, you know, the boss position or whatever. But, you know, specifically for regions, like, do you understand how the archaeology works? How does, you know, your experience and your skills apply to how the archaeology works in the place that you're applying? Even if you don't have specific experience and in some cases, like with the permits, that, 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 that'll actually be an issue. But in other cases, if you're just going for a job and you're just going for an entry-level job particularly, you know, just saying that you understand what the job is like. You know, I know what a shovel test is. I understand that even though I did my field school in, in such and such other country, that I understand how the field work works in the particular state that I'm looking at. 
and to that end, like if you're like for, for the listeners who are like, how am I even supposed to know that if I haven't worked there? Most states and provinces have some sort of guidelines online that are available. And it's kind of the state, I don't want to call them standards, but they're the guidelines of here's how the work happens here. Here's how we do it. Here's the various stages. Here are the phases. If, if you use phases or stages or whatever, you know, here's what we expect shovel testing intervals to be like. Here's what we expect, you know, like the process is usually laid out, particularly for people running projects. But mm-hmm. if you're going to one of these places and you've never actually worked there, it can benefit you to actually sit down and flip through that and see like, oh, I think I understand how the archaeology works. Yeah. To riff off of Stephen's, riff off of mine. Also, some advice. I mean, this is a bit outside of writing a resume and stuff, but well, actually not really. You should have someone local look at it. And so if you're looking to start your first job or you know looking to move regions and stuff, Look around for like local state or regional societies, send them an email and ask if they have a lot of CRM members or if there's a listserv or a Facebook group or, you know, there are built in communities and it'll differ from, you know, state to state, region to region. But there will be like a CRM community who mainly like works around a certain things so like uh, when I was back in New Mexico, it was NUMAC. Mexico Archaeology Council. In the UK, it's like things like CIFA, but those are like organizations. And you could ask, you know, can you put me in touch with someone who does CRM in this region and just send them your resume and be like, hey, is this, is this what someone, is this what the local resume looks like? Or this is it with this past muster or am I missing some really key detail? Like I've, I've, you know, I don't know anything about East coast archeology. span I have no idea. I, I've vaguely heard people talk about state permits. Maybe I think in Virginia, there's a state permit. I could be completely hundred percent wrong on that, but it's those sort of things you need to know. And so it'd be good just to ask people or even ask, there's a lot of Facebook groups for, Text and just you know, you could just drop a question and say, Hey, I'm trying to get work in Oklahoma. Could someone have a look at my resume real quick and see if you know I'm completely off base? If I'm talking about things that people don't even do in Oklahoma, yeah, you know, because like again, like you know, in certain places, you don't really do shovel test pits, like that's that's certain regions and states. And so, if you have a lot of experience in that, that may not translate, and so you'll have to like try to have play up other aspects of your resume. So yeah, try to get help, local help. Yeah. And, and use social media to your benefit as well. You know, you, most people are probably on either Facebook or Twitter and jump on there, see if there's anybody that will take a glance at your resume and, and give you some pointers. I mean, the worst they'll say is no. Right. But I've seen people put up that kind of stuff before on like the Archaeo Field Techs group on Facebook, for example. And, and I'm sure people do it on, on Twitter as well. I just don't pay as much attention over there, but you know, put it in the local language. So just like we were starting this off at the very beginning, it's like, you know, if you've got language issues, it's also terminology issues, right? So if you're looking for a job in the Southwest and you've only ever worked in the Northeast, try to put that experience into context for the Southwest. So yeah, sure. I don't have, you know, experience right here working on Hoacom sites, but I do have experience doing this and this and this and this type of artifact analysis and things like that, which could translate to something beneficial over here. But you're really only going to get the ability to write that by talking to somebody and, and maybe running it past somebody and seeing if they'll do it. A couple more issues that I want to bring up on this example resume that we were sent was really make sure things are clear. And again, running this by somebody else who's an impartial third party, maybe even somebody who doesn't know anything about archaeology, right? Just say, hey, here's a resume. It doesn't make sense to you, right? And, and again, I'm looking at the employment experience section, which is the last one. And there are some interesting formatting issues that I really didn't understand until I had to really kind of dial into it. And there's there's one line that has a date range and then the name of a company, right? And then below that, in the same font size and style is a date range that I didn't realize at the beginning was within the first date range. And then it, it then is a job title. And then there's another date range and then another job title. And then there, below that, there's another date range, which is a completely different company. But those two date ranges that are after that first one are 
the things that this person did while at that one company. And I didn't actually even realize that <laughs> because, because the formatting does not does not bear that out. Right. And I really had to kind of dig into it. But to be honest, if we were doing this podcast and I wasn't sitting here staring at this thing for an hour, I wouldn't even have got past that. I would just been like, I, my eyes can't even focus on this and I need to just move on and, and go to the next one. But I think, I think the big takeaway for me on this is this person actually does have quite a bit of archaeological experience and, you know, and, and a lot of it was a long time ago. Right. So they're coming back to archaeology, which there's nothing wrong with that, but maybe highlight, highlight some of the things you did while you were away from archaeology and the things that you learned that could be applied to archaeology in those ways. I've talked about that a lot in the past about taking your non-archaeological experience and turning that into bullet points for your archaeological experience. But that's just one takeaway I wanted to make is this person, you know, seems like they have a lot of experience. Again, it's a long time ago, but they have a lot of experience, did a lot of things, and that should not be dismissed. And I would hate for them to... uh, I don't know, not get a job or suffer from that because of a formatting issue, right? So learn that skill, learn how to get it formatted, run it past a few people, send it to a copy editor, you know, do something. And if you got to pay 50 bucks to send it to a copy editor and have them reformat your resume and it gets you a $50,000 a year job or even a $20,000 a year job, hell, it's better than being unemployed. So that's my big takeaway from this. Yeah. On that similar issue that you'd broaden up, you know, coming back into archaeology is all job experience is relevant experience. Actually, I shouldn't say relevant experience, but all experience you should put on on your resume or CV. Mm-hmm. And it could even be as much as one line that just says, between these years, I worked as a cook or I was a teacher or you know, I was something else. But if you have like massive gaps in your career or in your resume – People are going to wonder, gee, what did you do for 10 years? And it might be that, like, you know, you decided to have a family. And then that's something you could put into your cover letter just to say, hey, you know, for 10 years there, I was watching the kids. (laughs) And so I, I wasn't able to work. But after a couple of years, your resume gets really long. And you don't need to put every single job if they're very similar. So if you've been a field tech for five years, You've probably worked for, I mean, on the lower end, it's going to be at least a dozen companies. On the higher end, maybe like 50. And that's that's completely fine. Yeah, nature of the job. I mean, that's that's not even an employer every month and a half or so, which is pretty, you know, sometimes you can go through two employers or three employers in a single month on different projects. Mm-hmm. But what I've seen people do, and it works really well, is you just say like, you know, I was a field tech and then you just list the companies and you say, or, you know, if it gets too long, you say, you pull out the companies that are most relevant, like ones in that area or ones that you know how are known to do good work. And you say, I've, you know, I did this position for these companies, dot, 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 for, I don't know, summer of 2011 and winter 2017. And then you talk about what you learned in those positions because, you know, it's, it's going to be fairly similar and you could tailor that part, but you don't need to put in every single job once you start to get, you know, tons upon tons of jobs, especially in CRM where you, you are going to move around a lot. People are going to start to glaze over when they see the same thing, but you can, you can make a nice chunk and you could do that for your other experience as well. So I usually put mm-hmm. at the end of it, I say, you know, I was in these years, I was a, a cook worked at the university. I did public engagement for genetics. All the other jobs I did, I just do a quick list. And I just say, you know, there's that information. If you'd like me to provide more, I can. But really, it's actually just a list of, I've worked for a bunch of other organizations, did a bunch of other jobs, not too relevant to this position, but it shows that I was working during that time and that I could hold down jobs. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I was encouraged to see this resume because it helped me realize a couple of things like, Basically, it helped me realize that people who really want to do archaeology, that's not going to go away if you get another job or do something else. You're still going to want to do archaeology. <laughs> and I, I've met you know, a lot of folks who archaeology was not their career, but they'd volunteered on a lot of sites. And so they maintained mm-hmm. their entire career doing something else, you know, financial planning or being a nurse or even you know, a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad. And they volunteer on a bunch of sites. And over the years, they had so much experience that they were some of the most experienced people. But what this 
resume shows me is that that dream of being an archaeologist doesn't go away just because you're doing another job or something like that. People who want to be archaeologists, they still want to do this, whether they're getting paid to do it or not. And so it was absolutely awesome to see this person who wants to come back into archaeology because it it kind of reaffirms to myself, yeah, I actually wouldn't be happier working in another place. I would have all those same concerns that I used to have working at other employers when I wanted to be an archaeologist. And if I went and did that again, I'd still have those again. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. So I think the big takeaway from this episode is, you know, when it comes down to resumes and CVs, know your audience, first off. And then know the technology. Second, that's really what all this boils down to. Know who you're writing this resume or CV for, whether or not you even need a resume or a CV. Understand the differences between the two. And if you're in one country versus another, those terms could be interchangeable. Like I learned today, or at least remembered today. I don't know if I ever heard it before that, you know, a CV and resume terms are, are somewhat interchangeable over in the UK. So they, they mean very different things here in the United States. And you need to be aware of that. So, and at the very least, just ask ask questions. And, and to be honest, ask your employer. If you have the ability, if you're not just responding to a shovel buns post and you talk to somebody and they say, yeah, send me a, send me a CV. And it's like, okay, yeah, well, I did most of my work over in the, in the UK. And uh, when you say CV, do you mean like all my work experience, like uh, all 20 pages? Is that what you mean? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or no, no, we just need a one page, you know, that highlights your experience. They'll tell you that. I mean, just ask, right? They're not going to think less of you for doing that. In fact, I would think more of a person for asking something like that. So anyway, that's pretty much all we have time for. And I, I want to, you know, encourage other people to, I don't know, send us their resumes and CVs. Doug, do you have one last comment? Yeah, it's a, it's a last uh, little fact. <laughs> Apparently it's only United States and Canada that use a non-metric inches everywhere else in the world you're going to be sending in an a4 though apparently like mexico and the philippines you could maybe get away with it that was just from like our first segment uh, on page size I, I i picked steven and like it's the only other country that happens to use the american letter size yeah or like i said you know pdf just send them a pdf you don't have to worry about any sort of formatting. You know, isn't A4 longer? So you could actually get more detail on it if you wanted to, to go ahead and reformat it to that? Yeah. It's why like in UK universities, they usually do word counts instead of page counts. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. All right. Well, that's it, everybody. Again, uh, if, if you want to send in yours, I've had people send in a CV and, and resume to me just to take a look at. You know, do it like you would do a, uh, an employer, too. I have had people hit me up on like Facebook Messenger or something and just drop a CV and say, can you take a look at this? Like with no preamble. Hi, how you doing? Nothing like that. Like you're asking somebody to take time out of their day to do this, you know. Just have a little tact when you're doing it. That's all I would ask. And same if you're sending it to anybody that you're going to have them take a look at. Just understand that they're taking time out of the day to do that for you. So anyway, thanks a lot. And I'm glad we had this to talk about to kick off 2021. Hopefully some people can get some good jobs out of it. And yeah, good luck with that. All right. Back next time. That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archpodnet.com slash podcast. Please comment and share anywhere you see the show. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Support the show and the network at arcpodnet.com slash members. Get some swag and extra content while you're there. Send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you talked over you, Doug. It's gone. You have to do it again now. Oh, no. Uh, I, Chris, don't, don't even try that. You have separate tracks. This is why we use Zencaster. And so you can separate out and be able to get our sound separate, man. Don't, I, I, we used to do yeah. Skype where this would have been an issue. But I've been paying attention, Chris. I've been paying attention. You're totally right. You, you could take out Bill and keep my goodbye. <laughs> you also move that goodbye to the beginning of the show. I know. I'm going to have to do that because your goodbye is like floating out there in the ether now and from an editing standpoint because I've got to cut all this out. No, <laughs> no, I, I think all you, I, I, in. I, yeah, yeah. Chris, this should be my goodbye. It should be like this, you know, 30 second rant. Yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. Thanks everyone for joining me this week. Thanks also to the listeners for tuning in and we will see you in the field. Goodbye. All right.
Go Seahawks. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.